Hi and welcome to the Family Violence Collab Lab this morning. Uh, my name is Sabine Fanbacher and I am the facilitator of this session. Before we begin, I'm just going to... Hello, someone said hello in the chat, that's lovely. Um, before we begin um, with the content of today, um, I want to recognise and pay my respect to the traditional owners of the various lands that we are on today, where we work, where we live and where we meet today and where we want play as well. I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Nam, that's also known as Melbourne. I pay my respect to their elders past, present and future. I acknowledge First Nation people's strength, their survival, their continuous connection to land, to waterways and to community. Always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Now, dear audience, I'm just needing to tell you that um, you can see me maybe in a little picture and, <laughs> um, and also the slides, but I can't see you. So we'll just go, um, go um, forward as we do in this session. It is so great to be here with you um, this morning. In Nam in Melbourne, it's a rainy day outside and it's kind of cosy inside and I hope you are in a good space as well. And it's really lovely people sharing in the chat where they're positioned as well. And this is a big audience today. Um, we have about 240 people in the room, which is just fabulous. Um, and we're from all parts, um, I believe, across the country from many different um, disciplines and also from many different, in many different roles which is fabulous because that's what the spirit of today is about. It's to learn as much as possible about interdisciplinary collaborative care from each other and by talking with each other and relating with each other. We aim um, that at the end of this session that we all have increased our confidence about providing interdisciplinary and collaborative care when we respond to people who experience both mental health concerns or challenges and family violence, and that we also have a better understanding of how interdisciplinary and collaborative care can contribute to better outcomes for individuals and for families where family violence and mental health challenges or mental illness um, um, occurs. So just as a way of introducing you to um, this morning's session, um, which is day number two of this conference, and yesterday went really well, we just heard that. So today is a three-part activity. If we can click to the next slide, I think we've got a bit of an outline on that. In part one, um, great, thank you. To, um, so in part one, um, we're in this large room, even though it might not feel like that because you might be sitting in your office, but we're in this room all together. Um, in a little while, I will provide you with a pretty brief overview around some of the intersection of family violence and mental health. I will also um, pay attention to why and how COVID and climate change and weather related events might impact on this work um, that we do in this space. In part two, um, as you can see on the slide there, um, you will meet your moderators and um, we will put you into breakout rooms and we'll talk you through that in a, in, when we get to that how that will all work. And that's where you um, will come in really importantly and hopefully have some really good discussions um, and chats about um, vignettes that we have prepared for you for this session specifically. So you'll be provided with that vignette in your breakout room and, um, um, and we'll have a discussion, a guided discussion um, in that. In part three, as you can see there, we'll have some time to come back together in this larger group. The facilitators of the breakout rooms will provide a little bit of feedback so we can all share and hear what other groups um, learned or what they talked about. Um, and then we come to a close at 1 p.m. We are mindful of the large number of participants today. So here is how the fabulous people who've organised this conference and us together, how we're wanting to manage this. As you can see, and I can see the chat is quite busy there and people are saying hello, which is so lovely um, to each other and to all of us. In parts one and three, so when we're in this large group, um, you can't unmute and, and, um, and, and jump in to, to chat because there are um, 
as I said, 341 people we've got now in the room. So that will be just too much. But in the breakout rooms, of course, um, you will be able to unmute and contribute, which is what we're hoping that you do, um, of course. Um, you can also in the chat ask for any technical um, um, assistance and we know and have worked with the tech team, they're fabulous and they'll be reaching out um, <clears throat> to you to assist you if you've got any problems. Um, Emily, did you want to say anything on that? I think I can cover this. Emily is our tech person. So um, I think most of you have found the chat um, and, um, and are using that already. So we can probably um, go to the next slide unless you want to say something, Emily. Thanks. Hello. No. Hello, Sabin. No, all good, thank you. But yeah, certainly if anyone has tech issues, pop them in the chat and we'll be there. Thank yeah. You. When when you enter the room, Emily will talk you through that later on. Your camera will be off and you'll be muted and we'll ask you to um, turn all turn your camera on, but we'll come to that later. Um, and I will also, before you go into those rooms, I'll let you I'll introduce you to your facilitators. Okay. So let's do a little switch from all these kind of instructions. Um, there are a few and we'll come back to those. And I want you, I want to now uh, give you a bit of an overview um, around the area of family violence and mental health. We're not wanting to spend too much time on this. So as you could imagine, it's, it's kind of, a, yeah, it's a brief overview. And I want to touch on some of the issues. Of course, there are many more than I'll be able to talk about today. Um, I want to, to thank the Mental Health Professional Network to, um, that invited myself and others to um, look at the issue of family violence and mental health, um, which I'm really pleased to say, of course, across the country is gaining in focus. Some years ago, when many of us started working on this, um, people walked away and didn't want to know about it. You're all here, um, which tells me a lot about that um, things are changing across the country. So I'm grateful that you're here in this session. I wanted to, um, before going into the content, just uh, remind us that um, family violence is a pretty gendered um, form of violence um, and um, victim survivors, and that's a term I will use, um, which we use in Victoria, are mostly women and children. So mostly my talk will focus on that. But please remember always that, of course, there are many other people who also experience family violence, any gender, the LGBTIQ uh, plus community, and of course, men can experience family violence as well. Or there's also elder abuse. Um, um, but but that will be my mostly my focus. But we always want to keep in mind intersectional issues, but also you know that many different um, people can experience family violence. Of course, if we can go to the next slide, um, which just will tell you about acknowledgements. Um, we've um, paid respect to. Um, our First Nation um, people. I also always want to um, acknowledge victim survivors um, who, as I just said, are mostly women and children, but not only, um, women, children and young people. And um, I know this is a sobering way to start this session. I also want to, though, acknowledge those who have not survived family violence and all of us who work in this space we bring them with us as well and we want to remember them. And this is partly also why we do this work and continue to do this work to, to hopefully get to a place maybe one day where we don't have to do those acknowledgements anymore. I'm forever hopeful. Oh, this is so lovely. I can see little hearts coming up. Thank you. Oh no, well, you're with me. If we go to the next slide, um, that is a reminder to please look after yourself. Today in this session, as you transition out of this session later on, and also at any time that you work with somebody where family violence is present. Um, we know that in a room that this large or in almost any room, there will be many of us who've experienced family violence as a child or as an adult. We might um, love somebody who experiences it currently. It might be our neighbor. We might be working in it. Um, it is good practice to look after ourselves. Um, I've provided you here um, with one um, support um, organisation, 1800 Respect, which is known to many people. Um, and um, 1800 Respect doesn't just um, provide support to victim survivors, but also to professionals um, as well. 
Um, and at the end of the session, I have some more of, of this um, PowerPoint. Um, I have some more suggestions for you as well. All right. Um, let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Oh, we're already there. Thanks, Emily. You're fabulous. I want to take a moment and invite you to consider both issues, family violence and mental illness or mental health challenges, whatever we language we might want to use, and the stigma that is associated in our society with family violence. And then take a moment to consider the stigma associated with mental illness in our society. Consider the shame that we know that people who experience family violence experience and consider the shame associated with mental illness that occurs. I'm not saying that people ought to be ashamed, but we know there is a lot of shame about, around both issues. And then consider doubling of that shame and also of that stigma when someone experiences both and maybe they experience more um, issues than that in their life, but they, they might be experiencing both of those, which is why we're here. I'm always surprised that people tell us anything about family violence and their experiences. It is such an incredibly personal issue that is um, connected with so many emotions, um, and it is so hard to talk about it for many people. So I, I want to invite us all to keep that in mind as we go through this session today and as you discuss also the, um, the case scenarios um, later on, um, I nearly said this afternoon, later on this morning. Um, I always feel humble when somebody shares that they've experienced um, family violence and I, I, no matter who they are, if it's work, a neighbour, a family member or a friend, I thank them that they trust me with that information. So that's just a way of um, starting um, our, um, our kind of way into this um, conversation today. If we go to the next slide, um, there are many um, impacts and I've just listed a few of those here. Um, there are many more, of course. We know that, that family violence uh, disrupts people's lives um, hugely. Um, often there's a loss of, of income, um, you know, many, many financial impacts or impact on economic status. Lately, we hear more and more about, um, you know, that, that women, older women are um, the largest growing um, group of homeless uh, people in Australia, and not all, but many have experienced family violence. So it's, it's post-family violence. Family violence disrupts work and study for all um, generations, for children, for young people, for adults. Um, people have to move, um, or you know can't can't continue to to go to school where they are. Um, um, family violence impacts on health and also of course on mental health, um, and that's also what we're looking at today. If we can go to the next slide, um, there are a range of mental health impacts, and again I've just listed some here. Anxiety and depression is often experienced by people who go through family violence. Um, sleeping and eating problems, or if we um, in particular, when we know from a trauma-informed care and practice lens, we understand that some people will use drugs or alcohol or prescription medication use to um, ameliorate some of, some, some of the impacts um, or the triggers if, if the, the violence occurred during childhood or some years ago. Excuse me. Um, and we understand then where that comes from. Of course, sometimes that can um, become unhealthy or unhelpful um, way to live, but we understand why people might might, might do that to manage. They are, um, they are you know, sometimes post-traumatic stress symptoms, even if somebody doesn't have that, um, that um, diagnosis. Similarly, why somebody might self-harm to actually deal with flashbacks and triggers. So trauma-informed care and practice can really help us to understand that. Women with um, diagnosed mental illness in particular, if we go to the next slide, um, um, are confronted with a range of, um, range of issues. In the next few slides, I'm just wanting to talk with you about some of those. Most women who have a diagnosis of mental illness um, have experienced multiple um, types of trauma over a lifetime. 
um, we know that they ex have experienced or experienced high levels of family violence and are confronted with some systemic issues as well that I will come back to um, in a little while. See there the lack of access to services or appropriate support um, that is really holistic and brings all those issues together and I'm so grateful that we've got um, two colleagues who work on, on that and have um, been instrumental in setting up um, the first ever women's trauma service in, in the Illawarra, but we'll come back to that. So there are hopeful and many hopeful examples where people collaborate really well together. Um, another aspect of mental health and mental illness and family violence that is really, um, that hasn't um, had, I think, enough focus as yet um, is how mental illness is used against women or people um, when f family violence is being perpetrated. So the next slide, again, gives you a little, gives us a little bit of an overview. Um, and I call that weaponizing. Um, if we go to the next slide, we can see that. So for example, telling a woman that, um, you know, um, she lacks skills to live, live alone or without the other person. And we have many, many women who've said, you know, over time, my self-confidence got so eroded. I thought I couldn't live with this other person. I couldn't run my own life. Um, for women who are mothers um, or people who are parents, um, they often are accused that they're a bad parent. We know there's a lot of stigma around being a person with a mental illness and being a parent in society, that somebody couldn't be a good parent, but also it is used against and to threaten, you know, to get that, get professionals involved. Um, we know that um, of, of um, situations, for example, where the police turns up at the door, um, I'm going to stay in the heterosexual, um, you know, binary here, and the, the male of the, 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 um, the household, the family, is at the door, called come and collected and said, look at her, look at her, she's mad, she is a bad mother, she pushed me, I didn't do anything, and, um, um, and the woman is distressed and it, it, it kind of plays into, you know, what, what, what a person with mental illness looks like, but also that she's not a good parent. Um, and that we know from, from practice wisdom and from people with lived in living experience around making um, things up. For example, um, somebody, yes, yeah, somebody just said gaslighting, absolutely. So one example is um, somebody who might have a psychotic illness or an illness with psychotic features who comes home and um, says, oh, have you moved the furniture around? And the other person goes, no, I didn't do anything. Oh, I think, I think you're... You, you know, you, you deteriorating quotation mark, you, you becoming unwell, let's get the cat team involved or whatever. And actually, in fact, they had moved around the furniture. So playing into um, um, the, the, the symptoms or the, you know, um, how people are experienced when they have a mental illness. Um, and of course, if there are children involved, um, the, you know, shouldn't see the children and also trying to turn children, in particular adolescents, against um, the parent with a mental illness. Um, some of these things became worse. Um, you know, we were saying we want to also look at um, COVID and um, climate um, climate change and weather impacts. And I just wanted to give you some um, examples from, in particular, that time that I know, and I'm sure those of you um, in areas, um, if we, yep, we, we or we can we can stay with that as well. It doesn't matter. Um, so uh, p uh, p um, people who perpetrated family violence said, I've got COVID, you can't leave the house when we had lockdowns. Um, people in during lockdown were, lockdowns um, were spending all time at home. So there was really, um, you know, no, no escape. Um, services find it really hard to, to reach out. Um, child protection or other workers were saying we couldn't we couldn't see the children we you know we, we couldn't actually see the children and assess how the children are going to to, to get some good support um, we know that young lgbtiq plus people um, in particular if they hadn't either come out to their families um, or their families had already you know turfed them out or were were unsupportive of them had to move back in um, that was during covid we know how hard it is to rent at the moment too. So sometimes young people might have to move back in and all they have is their bedroom and their online community where they can get support if um, part of family violence perpetration is, um, you know, continuously misgendering um, um, somebody or 
uh, not accepting them and not supporting them um, in their, you know, gender identity or their sexuality. Um, and I also wanted to remind everybody, of course, that uh, those um, those things also have impact on those of you, all of us who who, who work in this area. Um, and that it was harder and can be harder during those times to actually um, get support to people um, because it is harder. We need to be more creative to um, to get support to people literally. And I know maternal child health nurses, for example, said they would make a time for somebody when they were allowed to go shopping to have a quick five, ten minute check in because the woman was allowed to do that. So just some examples of, of, of what happens um, during those times. Um, here you've got a few more, um, you know, um, quite awful really, uh, examples of how mental health or mental illness is weaponised. So threatening to take children away, if not that, but to report to child protection. And as a reminder, if we think about intersectional um, challenges and barriers, of course for some population groups that is a much larger threat um, for people with mental illness um, or parents with mental illness, of course, um, and it's a real threat um, and um, in our First Nation um, uh, communities um, where there is a history of child removal. So they are, they are, they are powerful things to have over somebody um, or threaten them with. And also, um, you know, forcing somebody to participate in, in the mental health service or call the CAT team, those kind of things as well. Um, if we go to the next slide, I just wanted to point out some, um, there are a lot of um, systemic barriers and challenges and hopefully we all work um, to minimise those. Um, and in um, the case scenario discussions, I imagine that you would talk about some of these as well. So um, there are multiple barriers to disclosure. Is it safe to disclose? Um, am I going to be met with the response that I'm seeking um, what is this professional that I'm seeing if I'm the person? What's their attitude? What are their skills? We know that um, um, some practitioners, of course, don't feel equipped or skilled to work in that area. Um, victim survivors are really good in picking that up and won't talk about it. Um, women with mental illness in particular, and you will see this comes up a number of times, and we know this from research, we know this from professionals, and we know this from um, lived in, um, people with lived experience, women with lived experience, um, that often they're not believed. Um, it's part of a delusional system. I have heard that often in clinic, in, 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 in some mental health areas. Um, or that um, trauma is missed. It's seen as a mental illness rather than a trauma reaction. Um, um, and also that, um, you know, exclusion from services. Um, we know that some services in the community might say, oh, we don't know how to work with women with mental illness. We can work with family violence, but not with this and the other way around. Um, moving on, um, women's experiences with health and mental health services has, um, um, I'm glad, has been researched. And our next slide um, provides you a little bit of an overview. Um, again, you see there, about not being believed, about being doubted or being dismissed. It's not that bad. That doesn't, this doesn't cause this. Or, you know, we're focusing on, let's say, the mental health and treatment and thinking that, that people, thinking that they can separate out um, the distress um, um, that family violence, um, 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 uh, the, the stress response as, as part of family violence or, or people saying it's not part of my role I'm not a family violence specialist um, and um, the good news is we don't have to be family violence specialists but we need to know enough about family violence to collaborate and support um, as well as we can um, in some um, areas of course in, in sometimes in mental health services it can be that, that um, again um, trauma or family violence um, is missed um, because the focus is so strong on biological factors that, um, you know, trauma doesn't. I think that is really changing and trauma-informed care um, has really um, been introduced across, even though, you know, we've got a long way to go to embed it. Um, I think all of that is changing a little bit. Um, so what can we do? Um, the next slide provides you with one um, way um, to think about this. And um, the World Health Organization way back in 2014 provided us with a, 
with a, an approach and a model, if you or best practice guidelines, which are listen, inquire, validate, enhance, and support. They did research, extensive research with um, people uh, with victim survivors, and they suggest this suggests is that what we can do is we can listen without judgment, we can inquire with healthy curiosity and respect. We can validate somebody's experience. We can enhance, and we must enhance their safety, and we can provide support and follow up. We might not be able to do all of that ourselves, but we can collaborate with other people, and that's why we're here today. The next slide um, provides you just with a, provides us just with a um, a bit of an overview of a. Um, a study done in uh, Victoria, which looked, which which asked women, "What do you want when you go and see a health um, professional and you've experienced family violence?" And part of it is seems so simple, and that part part of that makes me almost sad that what women want and often don't get is is an emotional connection, so emotionally connect, feeling connected with when they disclose family violence. I would also call it being met. Um, recognition and understanding, understanding what somebody is going um, through and, and recognising that they're going through family violence, that they're experiencing na it now or have experienced it. Um, but they also don't want it just to stop there. They want some action, as in support and some advocacy, and also really importantly, choice and control about what happens. And towards the end of this, and I won't go through that, um, there are two, um, we call them wheels that you could, um, in your own time, when you get the slides after the session, can take a look at also about how we can sometimes take away that choice and control if we're not careful and if we're not, um, um, and we, that we want to avoid a parallel process of doing two. So we always want to do with and respect someone's choice about, you know, uh, we might want to think that we want someone to leave, but we want them to um, to have um, autonomy over their decisions. Um, jumping to the next slide, and I'm just um, I'm just noticing the time, um, so I won't go through this long, but um, one of the most important things we can do is to validate, to validate what someone tells us, to respond to the person before the situation, so we don't have to jump into action, hardly ever, um, unless it's a life, a, a life threatening situation um, that we want to communicate that we see the person and believe them and that we want to be present for them, as I was saying earlier on. So thank you. That was a very quick um, um, overview. And even with that, I've gone a couple of minutes over, so I'll try to make up time. Yes, agree. The uh, sense of validation um, um, is uh, is sometimes the main thing that we can do. And if somebody has felt validated, they might actually come back to us to say, I, I, I would like to talk some more with you. Um, I could do this now. Okay. Change of, change of focus. I would now like to introduce you um, to our moderators um, in a moment. Um, there you will be um, going into breakout rooms and I can see them come up on our screen. How lovely. I hope you can see them too. Um, on the conference website, they're having a little wave, thank you. Hello team. Um, on the conference website, you can actually read everyone's bio. So I'm just going to do a quick introduction and, um, and, and you'll all introduce yourselves to your rooms as well. I'm wrapped to be here with these fabulous women. So Sally Stevenson, if you want to do a little wave again, Sally, is the Executive Director of the Illawarra Women's Health Centre and has been um, in that role for the past nine years. Um, Laura Brooks is the Mental Health Team Leader at the Illawarra Women's Health Centre and also a certified trainer for the Safe and Together model. Sally and Laura, together with others, have led a national campaign to establish Australia's first women's trauma recovery centre, which is well underway. Um, if you want to find out more about it, um, Google, Google the service. It's um, a very hopeful um, 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 initiative that hopefully, you know, eventually might be replicated across the country. 
Sarah Johnson, if you want to do a little wave, is an independent consultant, facilitator and coach who has worked in leadership roles in family violence and youth work and other um, sectors um, for over 20 years. Last but not least, Dr Liz, Liz McClendon or Elizabeth McClendon um, is a research fellow with the Sexual Abuse and Family Violence Program at the University of Melbourne. And she's also a senior sexual counsellor and counsellor advocate, sorry, at Casa House at the Women's Hospital in Melbourne. So you can see, um, audience, you are an excellent company with these fabulous women who will bring a vast experience to this area of work. Wonderful. I was just about, hello and welcome back everybody. We've got, oh wow, we've got 460 people. You all come back. Most of you have come back. Wonderful. Thank you. It was just a little tech glitch, um, but I'm now, I think, on camera and hopefully you can hear me. Um, and we've got our lovely um, breakout room facilitators in the space as well. And Sarah will join us in a moment too. So I dipped in and out of your sessions and there was vigorous and great discussions. So I'm not going to take up too much um, time right now and um, um, we'll hand over to the four facilitators in a moment um, uh, who will um, give a bit of feedback what, what, um, what, what the discussions were in your room. Um, so we're curious about... Um, what you what you learned, what your room learned, um, um, in particular around collaboration, and of course also some of the hurdles and opportunities. If you could give us like you know, three top points or something like that, that would be wonderful. Um, who would like to go first? Sally, you're you're unmuted. Did you want to go first? Oh, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. Um, because I was concentrating on something while you were saying that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, yeah. I might just start off with one that, I, I mean, I just yeah. want to thank the, the group that I was with because I thought the conversation was really rich and informed and um, positive around um, understanding of what was going on. But both a, both a um, protective factor but also a risk factor is the involvement of services. And I think it depends on how those services collaborate, obviously, but how they understand and um, interpret Emily's behaviour um, and how they acknowledge how to empower someone or how to work with someone from a strengths-based approach. So it can be overwhelming if you've got, you know, four or five services involved, you've got to go to appointments, you can't make them all because there's some coercive control. Um, but if those services, first of all, work together and take the opportunities of when somebody's in a room with them, they can access other services, um, and if they if they listen to what is important to her and then work from that basis and prioritise according to her needs and her perceptions, that's the beginning of respect and dignity and empowerment. So it really does, you know, services can really be both. And so what we need as a sector is to understand the underlying complexities of domestic violence the symptoms and the needs to be strength-based and, and, and person-based. Oh, what a fabulous um, um, summary. Thank you, Sally. That sounds like such a rich discussion and I know I was in it. Um, a couple of things just to quickly pull out. Strengths-based collaboration. We Practitioners can also feel um, overwhelmed by the number of organisations involved, isn't it? Um, and go at the person's pace. Um, uh, as a reminder, in the in the PowerPoint that people get later on, there's a, there are two tools in there that I thought might be helpful. One is the power and control wheel that, that describes behaviour that is called domestic or family violence, which sometimes practitioners have still to this day find helpful to when talking with somebody. In particular, I know in some conversations where people were saying, what if the person doesn't recognise it? It can be a helpful tool. But there's also one about a medical power and control wheel. Um, you know, and Sally, what I'm just hearing is, you know, let's go by what the person wants. We might have our hopes and dreams and wishes, but it's actually what the woman wants. I'm not talking about pointy end life death situations. Other things have to be done. And sometimes we have to override someone's right in that way. But really, it's about meeting where they're at, validating and working with them, isn't it? Um, 
which is which is what you've just said. Fabulous. Thank you, Sally. Um, welcome, Sarah. Um, as well, we, we jumped into the feedback and we're doing it a little bit um, going around the room. So Laura or Liz, just to let you settle in a bit, Sarah, who would like to go next from your group? Just tell us I'm happy to, to jump in um, and to say that my group also had a fantastic discussion and I want to thank everybody who participated in that. We focused on the vignette of Ruth. Uh, I think it was really clear in our conversation that we as a clinician from a particular, with a particular professional background or, or working in a particular service or perhaps in private practice, kind of have one piece of the puzzle and that when we can talk and collaborate with other services or other people with expertise, we're really increasing um, what we've got the potential to do and that collaboration, especially in a situation where, you know, we had three members of a family here that we were, we were trying to think about all together, um, that that really increased what we had the capacity to do in terms of identifying risk, in terms of identifying protective factors and trying to strengthen those, but also in terms of trying to knead out some of the hurdles to multi-agency um, or multi-service responses to a family like this. Some of the other things that people were saying really strongly in our group was around trying to um, recognise that Ruth's experience as a victim survivor may be one of not having control, not being in control, and that in our role as a clinician or a service provider, if we can be trying to share as much control to try and be um, really clear uh, in our communication, in trying to um, talk through and hear what it is that the victim survivor wants and needs, what their assessment of risk is, um, is a way of trying to maximise how much control Ruth feels. Um, but that also, you know, someone really poignantly pointed out in our group that the um, person using abusive behaviour, in this case it was Ari, that Ari... Uh, might seem to us, he'd been threatening self-harm behaviour, he might seem to us as somebody who's increasingly feeling out of control and that he is trying to get control in a way that's harmful by using violence in the family. So kind of picking up on that as a clinician and thinking about how can we adaptively work with that need for control in a way that's kind of safe. But somebody else really importantly said in terms of trying to increase the opportunities for effective collaboration that... Um, maybe mapping out the services that are involved and trying to talk about who's going to be the lead here, who's going to try and coordinate the services um, and everyone be on the same page with that. But really importantly, the victim survivor kind of being in control of aware, being aware of who's, who's involved um, and then who might kind of lead some of those collaborations. Sorry, I just wrote a note down and there's lots of clapping going up <laughs> and you just finished. Thanks, Liz. What a great summary and sounds like a fabulous discussion as well. And I know I was in the room a few times um, as, I, as I walked around the rooms. Um, so much around, I was just thinking, um, you know, I, none of us know everything, know, know everything about somebody's situation, don't we? And I think what's starting to really come to the fourth and I know it's not something new, but sometimes we forget that we have a particular angle, but also we have a particular, we, we only get part of a story um, for no other reason that there is many people's lives. So, you know, there's a lot going on. So by collaborating with others, we can respectfully um, put that kind of picture, understand the person better as a as, as the person in their family, including their um, their, their children. Um, and also, Liz, what you were saying that you talked about, that sharing sharing of power and power and control and not doing two again, um, um, you know, to somebody, um, but also recognising sometimes we need to recognise that we're in a relatively powerful situation. Well, we're a worker, aren't we? Someone comes to us for assistance. So unless we recognise that, um, we, we, we might find it harder to, to share um, that power. And another thing that came to mind was... Um, that collaboration ought to get rid of hurdles, get rid of barriers, and that we want to contribute to getting rid of those and, and up and um, increasing um, um, support and safety and simplifying the system, not making it more, more, 
more complex, isn't it? And I know in the past when I've been in situations where, you know, a few of our service providers get overwhelmed, then I think, wow, what must it be like for that person or the family? It's a good indication, isn't it? Because there's sometimes a parallel process. Thanks, Liz. Um, who wants to go next? I'll jump in. Um, we are in our vignette was Emily, so we focused on that, which for those that didn't have Emily um, was a family and there was some child protection involvement as well. And really similar to, first of all, um, as Sally mentioned, I want to thank my group as well. We had a really diverse um, set of expertise within the space that I was in and diversity too in terms of where people were around the country in rural, remote, as well as um, regional and the city. So that was really excellent. But we were very similar to some of the things that Liz and Sally shared is that we talked a lot about remaining child-centred, so focusing on the impact of, you know, coercive control and violence on mum and then what that means for attachment with her two children, how that impacts on her mental health and impacts on, you know, if there's substance use and also impacts on her relationship and her time with the kids. So that was a big focus. And one of the participants shared at the end around the importance of holistic practice. So, you know, we spoke a lot about moving away from the siloed practices where exactly what Sally said, we're sending women here, there, everywhere, and women are having to navigate this complex system while they're in still in DV um, and managing multiple things and how confusing and overwhelming that is, you know, for someone that's functioning at a high level and not in DV, let alone someone that's in this high level of coercive control. So we spoke a lot about, similar to what Liz said, around a lead agency in our um, vignette, we thought that would be child protection and someone taking the lead on coordinating collaboration, services, sharing information. For us, we use the analogy, analogy of the iceberg. And so, like Liz said, sometimes we have someone in our office presenting and we're seeing the tip of the iceberg, but we're not understanding all of the stuff, which in our vignette was the coercive control that's underneath that's impacting and creating this presentation. So we talked about the importance of systems and um, practitioners collaborating and sharing information so we can understand what's happening for a mum. And we also talked about, you know, um, systems like child protection, working with fathers as well and working with fathers around their mental health, around their use of violence and, you know, one, to holding them accountable and getting them to take responsibility, but also give to giving them the opportunity to um, create meaningful change, to be better role models for their children and to think about how they want to be with their children, how they want to be role models and what they want to change in their lives. So we spoke about that um, as well. That was a really quick overview. Yeah. Thank you. Well, gosh, I'm amazed how well you're all doing in summarising really complex um, discussions. Thanks, Laura. So lots of things to take there as well. And I was just looking into the chat a little bit and people are really appreciating, even some people who missed out on some of the session really find this helpful. So I'm, I'm, I'm so glad about that. So you've raised similar issues, but also additional ones around um, that collaboration um, and a really important part, isn't it, for a long time, certainly those of us who've worked in the family violence or domestic violence sector know that um, if we stay in that gender binary, you know, um, men who use violence, there has been still, there still isn't, there's still so much more work to be done and unknown. In another session, someone also said, you know, um, how do we how do we work with men to, to, to assist them and change their behaviour. And we know there are some programs, but there certainly aren't enough. Laura, what you also raised, I thought was, um, I know in Victoria, we've talked about this very, um, uh, this uh, a fair amount is when, uh, for example, someone who uses violence is involved with a, in this case, a mental health service or an ARD service or whatever service, how important that relationship is and actually supporting, in this case, a male who has maybe a mental illness um, and be really sensitive about and really know about how to work with them if they're both using violence because we don't want to sever that relationship 
because that's that that can be a protective factor for somebody you know if they if their mental health gets better um not that that causes me um you know using violence but it certainly increases stress if somebody's mental health is not going so well so um just a reminder that we want to support people you know that people also who use violence of course need good support from from a range of people as well thank you last not but not least if we can come to you sarah if you can give us a little overview of your conversations thanks so much sabine I, I'm, I'm very conscious being the last person to report back i, I don't want to repeat what others have said so i, I thought what i might do is actually say, share some of the reflections from our group around you know, why they would collaborate um, because I think this is incredible some of what people shared was incredibly powerful as, as we left um, our discussion I you know, asked them well, why would you why would you collaborate based on everything that we'd heard in our discussion and um, some of the things that people said were you know, well we want to be able to provide wraparound support that is going to be the best support for every part of the concern or issue or opportunities that we're, we're seeing present um, people talked about kind of having more eyes on or more heads around, you know, the, the work. So having more eyes on the family, being able to share um, the risk factors, pick up on things that maybe others haven't um, to ensure that we've really um, driving the best risk assessment and risk management process possible. Um, we had people um, describe that, you know, the, the more collaboration that is occurring, um, the more opportunities there are for people to see if risk is escalating. And so that's going to enhance safety um, as, as um, we progress with working alongside folks. One of our uh, participants uh, also talked about that actually you know, they were reflecting that in the, the resource poor, sort of very remote Indigenous setting that they operate in, the need for collaboration is actually fundamental to, to being effective, um, that, that without collaboration they couldn't actually be effective in, in responding to family violence. Um, there were also some reflections around um, just that collegiate support that comes with collaborating. So, you know, being able to share skills and knowledge, um, learning, reflective opportunities, having those uh, opportunities to, to have these really established um, service provider relationships um, with, with each other um, and sharing values and, and really kind of moving towards a, you know, a safer community for everyone. Um, and I, I jotted down um, this, this quote from someone from the chat because I loved it and I just think it's such a, it just summarises why we do this work together. Um, and this person said, and I'm sorry, I was being so quick, I didn't grab the person's name, but they said, because violence and control thrives in isolation and individualistic approaches, which I just think is just the icing on the cake of this conversation. So thank you so much to my group for the beautiful sharing um, today. Oh, and I hope you could see that um, in your group. You just got a whole lot of love hearts. I so oh, love that, how we can nice. do that. Thank <laughs> you too, Sarah, for a really comprehensive um, summary. Wow, again, and I'm glad you looked at, um, you know, why would you collaborate and what's the benefits from it? Because sometimes we can get caught up in, oh, um, you know, of course it takes time. It takes time to establish relationships. But my goodness, when, we've, when I know, when I've collaborated, it's nothing to pick up to pick up the phone, uh, to, you know, to connect with people and get some support as well. And, and as we're coming to towards the end of this session, it's also our peers or our colleagues that sometimes we can debrief or, you know, we're all impacted sometimes and we can say, I'm finding this really hard. Um, you know, those good, good things as well. But also, and also what you were saying about more eyes on a family, for example, you know, sometimes there are multiple, there are several children, there are other family members involved. Sometimes there are more, is more than one person who uses violence against someone who can keep their eye on everybody. We can't. Um, and that goes for the, 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 um, the risk factors which you looked at as well and also the protective factors isn't it because if we don't talk with the teacher we don't know that that child is doing you know x y or z at school and is going really well or not so um, if i don't talk with the maternal child health nurse who has excellent skills around recognizing signs and symptoms in babies about family violence we miss out on you know a response from a baby so i suppose the reminder in those last few minutes and there's lots going on on the chat i'll have a look look at it later sorry we can't read it out um 
is that collaborating absolutely those those keeping those eyes on on everybody but also that holistic care and that beautiful quote Sarah that you um, and thank you to the person who did that absolutely what is one of the things that is so often part of perpetration or family violence or intimate partner violence is isolating people from support so the better the more we can work against that and the more we can work together respectfully in terms of you know information sharing and all those things um, the 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 more we can get rid of some of that isolation, um, at least in a service context that doesn't make up for everything, but but it makes up for some. I think another really clear message there was um, children. And really, if we don't know um, so much the signs and symptoms about children and what they go through, we can contact someone who might or who might be working uh, with children and uh, know that we are all getting much, much better at that, but children often still are uh, overlooked um, or people, you know, um, forget to or don't know how to engage with children about it. So we want to talk to some experts, easily done, they're, 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 they are available. Um, how we can say yes rather than no, I thought, I know that nobody said that, but but it's kind of like how, how do we get rid of barriers and go, yep, sure, let, let, let me see what I can do and who do I need to collaborate with to, to get um, holistic care. And one of the things, um, I think, Laura, I'm borrowing that from you, in your group, you said um, um, we might not be family violence specialists, we might not be trauma specialists, we might not be specialists in child abuse, in sexual abuse. We all have a role in it, though, don't we? And some of us in the state of Victoria, for example, were legislated to assess for it. So it is actually by law now that people have to have a role. They, they, they eventually, you know, we all have a role um, and we even have a role outside of work. I have a role with my neighbour who I supported a couple of years ago when she experienced family violence. I felt like that was my responsibility to support her and her little boys. Um, um, but we certainly at work have a role to respond, to, en to engage, to respond and support. Um, and um, maybe that's something we amongst many many other things that we can all take from today sounds like from your discussions in your groups though that everybody was pretty you know um pretty au fait with that and of course already has taken responsibility so thank you so much i'm going to bring us to a close um time flies when you're having fabulous um feedback and conversations thanks so much to the four of you um i dobbed you all in um and I'm so glad that you said yes. I've re really enjoyed working with you. And um, thanks for doing a brilliant job at facilitating. Thanks to the Mental Health Professional Network to not shy away from looking at family violence and mental health. And as I say that, I can feel myself getting um, quite emotional. And I was emotional early on. And that just shows after 35 years, this still affects me. And I'm really glad that we're all here today. So thank you, audience, also to coming for, to this session today, to not sh shying away, to wanting to engage um, and to engaging so well um, in this um, collab lab, as it's called. We really hope you got a lot out of it and it looks like you, you did. And thank you so much for contributing, everybody. Now, just a couple of reminders before we close this session that you can continue um, this discussion in a networking hub from 2 to 2.30 this afternoon. Um, to do that, you just need to navigate back to um, to the network hub and go to the lobby and Emily will come in in a moment and might just say um, some more things about that. Um, there's also a guided mindfulness session beginning in 15 minutes. This is, even though we're just on the screen, we are part of community and um, there are other things going on this afternoon for you. And you might also not want to miss this evening's plenary and panel discussion the nexus between climate change and mental health, which of course, there's a huge connection, we know that. Um, we've also probably all experienced um, some of that as well. That is um, at 6pm Melbourne, Sydney, Hobart time. Um, can I thank you all um, for being here today and I've really appreciated um, chairing this session. Um, and before we go, I'll hand over to Emily um the trusty tech support uh, here today who will talk to you about filling out please a survey and i'll see you around australia at some other stage hopefully <laughs>